I invite you to take your Bibles once more and turn in the New Testament to the book of Colossians. Colossians chapter 3. We pick up our study this morning look at verse, looking at verses 12 to 15. I remind you that this is God's word. Holy, inerrant, infallible, inspired, preserved for us even to this day that we might hear it, believe it, and we might heed it. And so let us give our attention to the reading. Colossians 3, beginning in verse 12. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we continue our study in Colossians and I want to remind you that we have looked so far all the way beginning in chapter 1 at what the Apostle Paul has said is true of us as believers in Christ. The Apostle Paul has spoken about how we have been transferred from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved Son. He has spoken about the forgiveness of our sins that we have, that, that our sins have been forgiven because they have been nailed to the cross, that record of debt that stood against us with all of its demands. And he has stressed how, how our life is, is now in Jesus Christ. You see, something that happened so long ago, it is not as though Christ stands far off from us, disconnected from us and from our experience. Indeed, if that were the case, then our message would be, would be nothing. No, our hope and our message, our proclamation is not that we look back at something that happened so long ago that doesn't have anything to do with us, but that we have been wrapped up in what happened on the cross. This is how Paul says it all the way back at the beginning of Colossians 3 that we began this study of resurrection life. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Make no mistake, that is not some way of waxing poetical. For Paul to speak this way of our life being hidden with Christ, of us being of us having died, as he says in Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. You have been raised with Christ. For the Apostle Paul, this makes all the difference. You see, there are so many religions and so many philosophies that will tell you how to live and why you ought to live that way. But Paul is not interested in a worldly philosophy. Remember, he has written this epistle in order to confront the idea of worldly philosophy. He wants to stress that we live and move and have our being only in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And so he began, and we looked at this last week, to tell us what it is that we are then to put off. He says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Note that for the Apostle Paul, when he goes to talk about what it is we are to not do, and how we are then to live, he is looking, of course, at the law of God. He is looking at how God has commanded His people from all the way back in the Old Testament to heed His word. And He calls us to walk in that. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Last week, as we look at the beginning of resurrection life, then we noted that it was by way of negation what we are to put off, what we are not to be. In our passage this morning, we see what it is we are to be positively 
what it is we are to put on, as Paul says in Colossians 3, 9 and 10, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge of the image of its creator. This language of putting off and putting on brings to mind clothing, and that's actually helpful because as we look in the Old Testament in Zechariah chapter 3, we're told about this instance where, 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 where the clothing that this man named Joshua, the high priest, is wearing, uh, they, they're, they, they're covered, and it's covered in filth. And in that passage we read that it's signifying the sins, the iniquity of the people. And he's told that his sins are going to be forgiven. And so he's taking off those garments, those filthy garments, and he's being clothed in clean clothes of righteousness. It's wonderful uh, imagery to bring to mind as we think about the reality that though we are sinners, that we stand before God as righteous in his sight, not because of what we have done, but because of what Christ has done. Because of his righteousness. And we, being robed in his righteousness then, are called to walk accordingly. See, that's what this passage is getting at this morning. The growth in holiness that we are to walk in. As we begin this, then we want to be cautious. You see, there are some who believe that justification is the work of God and sanctification is the work of man. And I must say that if you take that approach, that if your right standing before God is completely based on what God has done, and the sanctification is based on what you do, then your assurance will always struggle. Because you see, sanctification flows from your justification. And because it flows from your justification, if your sanctification is imperfect, and by imperfect we all know that we struggle then you will constantly be in doubt about your justification. If you ever ask yourself, if I'm a Christian, why do I struggle with this? Fill in the blank. Why does this continue to be an issue for me? But we are told in our shorter catechism, reflecting the words of Scripture, that sanctification is a work of God's free grace. For remember what the Apostle Paul has said, that we are being renewed in knowledge. There he uses the passive, as does our catechism, whereby we are renewed in the whole man after the image of God and are enabled more and more to die unto sin and live unto righteousness. And yes, it is that growth in holiness that God calls us to, and it is the growth in holiness that God is working within us. As Paul says in Philippians 2, verses 12 and 13, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do according to His good pleasure. This, by the way, is something the Apostle Paul is continually reiterating throughout his letters. The call to walk in newness of life. Why? Because we have been given new life. The call to walk as those who have been united to Christ. Because as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So as we think about this work of sanctification, we want to understand, we want to understand the truth of it. That it is God who works in us. And what good news this is. And I believe this is reflected in our passage today. So let's look at our passage together. We learn three general truths of our sanctification and a lot of particular truths along the way. And the first general truth that we learn is the source of our sanctification. The source of our sanctification, Paul says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. We learn, first of all, that God is the source of our sanctification. This is, of course, no surprise. If sanctification is a work of God's Spirit, then He must be the source. And when Paul says the ones who are chosen, he means literally, and this is how the Greek is worded, the elect of God. The elect. And it brings to mind Abraham, Moses, Israel, David, the prophets. They were all chosen by the Lord. Indeed, nowhere in Scripture do we find people seeking after God. He is the seeker. He is the chooser. The Apostle Paul underscores this in Romans chapter 3, citing the Psalms when he says, No, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. 
Jesus affirms this in John chapter 4 when he's speaking to the woman at the well. When he says to her, the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is the one who seeks. God is the one who elects. And what good news is this to us, beloved? For Paul will say in Romans chapter 8, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. The source then is God and His call upon our lives as those who are in Christ. And what does it mean to be the elect of God? The Apostle Paul teaches us in this verse. He says, Holy and Beloved. We want to give our attention to these two words, these two special words that Paul uses to speak of what it means to be elect. To be holy means to be set apart for God's purpose. This, of course, reflects God. He is the one who is set apart. Remember in Isaiah chapter 6 when Isaiah is lifted up into God's presence and he sees the Lord and he sees the, the, the glory of his robe filling the temple and the angels and they are crying out, holy, holy, holy. In Revelation 4, we hear the angels and the elders around the throne crying out the very same thing. God is set apart from creation. He is holy. And what Paul says then is that God's people reflect God in this way. For the word that he chooses here, hagios, it means to be set apart. We only need to think of 1 Corinthians 7 where the Apostle Paul says there, speaking of course of the children of at least one believer, he says that your children are holy. Now note that we don't believe there that he means he's saying they are saved. They are set apart. And regardless of your position on infant baptism, the reality is that Christian parents understand this for they teach their children to pray. They teach their children to repent of their sins. They don't sit back and say, we'll wait until we see the stirrings of the Spirit within you, and then we'll tell you about this triune God that we serve. No. They teach them what it is to love God. Why? Because they are holy. They are set apart. They don't belong to the world. Yeah. Beloved, you don't belong to the world. That's what Paul is saying here. Holy and beloved. This idea of beloved, of course, we could say that Paul had great affection for the Colossian Christians. He speaks of this in the opening verses of, of this book, and you can go back and look at those verses, but it's not Paul's love that he's speaking of here. It is God's love. And here we find a wonderful truth as we reflect upon our redemption. For too often it is thought that the Father has nothing but wrath for us, And he's a wrathful God who is watching and waiting for us to mess up so he can smite us. And if it weren't for Christ who stood in the gap, who stood in the middle, then God's wrath would consume us because that's all that he wants to do. As though we are sinners in the hands of an angry God. That is not the image that scripture gives to us of those who are chosen, of those who are wholly set apart. They're beloved. You see, it is God's love that is the grounds of salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. The Apostle Paul teaches us then elsewhere that God's love is a love that saves Moreover, it is an everlasting love. Psalm 103 and verse 17, the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. You see, it has no beginning and it has no end. As Gerhard as Voss so, so poignantly put it, the greatest evidence that God will never cease to love you is that he never began. For he has always loved his people Now the truth of the matter is that we have to only look at the person of Jesus Christ to see just how true these things are. That those who are in Christ are chosen and holy and beloved because He was chosen, holy and beloved. And our life is hidden with Christ. You are a chosen race. 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, Peter says in 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. All of this reflected because Jesus himself is the one who is chosen. He is the cornerstone who is chosen. He is the Holy One of God. He is the one of whom God said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Again, as Paul says in Colossians 3, You have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So, the source of our sanctification then is God, the fact that we are chosen, holy, and beloved. But then Paul presses on because we are called to live a certain way in light of that reality, in light of what God is doing. This is the fruit of our sanctification. Put on then compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. I want to take these in pairs, at least for the first six. We see first compassion and kindness. They are related. Compassion is literally here in the Greek bowels of mercy. It can also be translated as tender mercies. It speaks of the heartfelt affection that believers have for others. Sympathy for the needs and the sufferings of others. The sensitivity that we are called to have when someone is hurting and that we must be willing to help. We're reminded of how Paul says to do good to everyone and especially to those who are the household of faith. We're called to put on this compassion, noting again that this is something that we grow in throughout our lives. Compassion and kindness. This word can be translated as goodness or even generosity. It speaks of a gracious sensitivity towards others that shows itself in genuine care for their needs. I think of the story of the Good Samaritan. You remember it, of course, in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. The man who was beaten and left dying. And the others, the, the, the ones who went past him and crossed over to the other side and didn't want to walk near him for fear, perhaps, of being defiled by a dead body. But the Samaritan comes and he binds up his wounds. He provides for him. I remember the context of that story. The context of that story is there's somebody trying to trap Jesus by asking what he must do to inherit eternal life. And when Jesus comes down and asks him what it is that he's called to do, and he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But desiring to justify himself, Jesus said, or he has, he said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? You see, the man was seeking to define some way that he didn't have to help. He didn't have to show compassion and kindness. Jesus makes clear that by God's providence that there are people in our paths and it is to them we are to show compassion and kindness. And make no mistake, we live in a day and age where it seems so easy to change your profile picture in order to show solidarity, compassion, for something or someone on the other side of the world that has nothing connected to you or anything that you must do that is not compassion or kindness. Compassion and kindness tends to be among those with whom we interact with every day. Humility and meekness, Paul moves on, not only to put on compassion and kindness, but humility and meekness. Humility speaks of a lowliness of mind well, this is opposed to the way that people saw themselves in Paul's day and in our own day. Self-boasting self in Paul's day was considered an act of honor. It would often lead to the promoting of oneself, but doing it in such a way as to not make it look like they were promoting themselves. But following Christ, Paul tells us that the Christian is, not, is truly to not promote themselves. He says it this way in Philippians 2, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Look not to your own needs, but also to the needs of others, he says. 
We're to put on humility. We're to put on meekness. This is a kind of gentleness. But, and this is where we have to understand the word that Paul is using here. You see, we have this idea of meekness being weakness. We think of it as synonyms. In fact, if you look it up in the dictionary, the synonyms would be yielding, compliant, tame, timid, unresisting. But the word means literally strength that accommodates another's weakness or reserved force. In fact, it's a word that was used among the ancients to describe their war horses. And no one would refer to a war horse as weak. The point being that the horse was under the control of the master. And so that strength was placed under the control, following the commands of the master. The believer is not called to be weak or to become a doormat, but rather this meekness calls us, calls us to have our strength under the control of our master. Not seeking our own good and our own needs, but the needs of others. Who? Those that God has placed within our lives, around us. All we need to do is to look around us. Those that we interact with. Those that we see who are down and discouraged. It's to them that we must go and, and encourage and build up. Paul presses on. We put on not just compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, but also patience and forbearance. Patience and forbearance. This means literally not holding one's sins against them. That is, forbearance means that patience refers to long-suffering. It refers to a refraining from exacting revenge or retaliation against someone. It speaks of being willing to endure wrong. Jesus affirms this in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5, verses 38 to 45. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall not love your neighbor. You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say that you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. As Matthew Henry so carefully points out, if God is long-suffering to us under all our provocations of Him, we should exercise long-suffering to others in like cases. Indeed, that brings us to the last one. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Now don't misunderstand this word that he uses there, complaint. You see, children hear from their parents often, don't complain. What they really mean, and I've drawn this distinction out before, biblical complaining is when you actually have something that's wrong, and the person you go to the person that can do something about it, that is a complaint. The opposite of that is grumbling. What parents truly mean, children, is don't grumble. To complain is to have a legitimate wrong and to go to the one who can help. And here, Paul acknowledges that we might have complaints against one another. You see, we might legitimately wrong one another. And I know that I've used the word might there and we all want to chuckle at that. Because it's true that if you are actually a community of believers, what the New Testament teaches us is that there are going to be complaints. Yes, there will be grumblings too, but let's set those aside. There will be true complaints. You will say something and offend somebody. I will offend you. You will offend me. How do we respond like that when, when that happens? Think about it. We're bringing new members within our church today. More opportunities for complaints. Again, not grumbling. Complaints. What happens when we sin against one another? Paul says... We forgive. We forgive. And to add to why we forgive, he says, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Note that he uses there the word must forgive. 
And I just draw that out because there is this idea that seems to go around every now and then that you don't need to forgive somebody unless they have repented. That you can withhold forgiveness from somebody and you can just simply let it sit within you until they repent. But that is not what Scripture teaches us. No. To where God simply to sit back and say, I will not forgive you of all your particular sins until you repent of all of them particularly. None of us would get anything else done except spending our days in repentance. No, we must, we must forgive one another. And just as we saw that being chosen and holy and beloved, that these point us to Christ, so also we see that these attributes that Paul tells us to put on point to Christ as well. For he is the one who is full of compassion for sinners. He is the one who is kind in all that he does. He was humble and he was meek, for he could have called down a legion of angels to save him from the cross. He is patient. He bears with our weaknesses. He forgives. This is all certainly true of him in his estate of humiliation, that is, when he was on earth. And it was there on the cross when all of them come together, when he calls out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But he knew what he was doing. He was saving his people from their sins. No wonder we sing, Hallelujah, what a Savior. And indeed, all of these attributes continue to characterize our Savior in heaven. It is a state of exaltation. And what good news this is. For we are still those who are in need of God's compassion and kindness. Of patience and forbearance. Forgiveness. Indeed, even as we are called to put these on, we are reminded that it is our Savior who wears them perfectly. And we are in Him. Indeed, we are called to put on these things because this is how we reflect Christ as we are being conformed to His image. And so we see first the source of our sanctification and the fruit of our sanctification. And lastly, we see the root. Above all these, Paul says, put on love, which binds together, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Put on love. That is, as those who are loved by God, to be loving of others. And Jesus says in John 13 and verse 34, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. The Apostle Paul teaches us in 1 Corinthians 13, not just what love is, but of its supreme importance. He says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Now the Apostle Paul understood the importance of putting on love because love is, 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 is the one that, yes, it binds them all together because all these attributes flow from love. Flow, of course, from God's love. We love because He first loved us, John teaches us. But they bind, it binds everything together because they all flow from love. Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And it goes on, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But that first one, love, shows itself in all the other ways. All of these attributes are tied together by love because they all flow from love. But interestingly, Paul is not, interest, is, is not worried about tying the attributes of the virtues together in unity. Instead, he is concerned about the church being joined together in unity. 
For just above this passage, he has spoken about how there's Greek and Jew and barbarian, skinny and slave and free. He says they're not all these different disparate parts, but rather they've been brought together in one community. And that's how he ends here in verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. That love from God, that love that we are called to have, is what binds us all together. It is the root of our sanctification, that what grows out of the love that God has worked within us is compassion and kindness, humility and meekness, patience and forbearance, and forgiveness. And Paul says to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The peace of Christ. Now the peace that he's speaking of here undoubtedly is connected with the peace that Jesus himself talked about. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid, he says in John 14 and verse 27. But as Paul points out elsewhere in his epistles, this is the peace that we have with God as well as the peace that we have with one another. And indeed, Paul will go on to apply this to the Christian home in chapter 3 and verses 18 and following. But here he speaks more generally to the church. The peace that is to rule within our hearts to which we are called in one body. Now when he says that this peace is to rule in our hearts, the peace of Christ is to rule in our hearts, he means that it is to judge in our hearts. That is, that we are to make our decisions on the basis of the peace from Christ, particularly as it relates to our relationships within the church. For we are one body, and a body at war with itself causes damage. This also invades our lives in this world. Jesus did not know peace in this world, but he had peace with his Father and was able to endure suffering as we are conformed to Christ. We should not expect perfect peace in this world, with this world. But our peace with God, from Christ, rules in our hearts, rules in our lives, and informs how we respond to the suffering and the conflict that we face. And Paul ends, and be thankful. He was going to go on, he's going to talk about this thankfulness, and he's going to say one of the ways that we show this thankfulness is, is in our song. But here we want to note that Christ's peace brings thanksgiving. Gratitude, yes, for our redemption, but also for the ongoing work within our hearts of sanctification. For as we began, it is not something that we do in our own strength. It is the work of God within us. It is the fruit of the Spirit grounded in the love of the Father for His people and the mercy of Christ in going to the cross for our sins. When we reflect upon that, how can we not be thankful? How can that not produce in us true thankfulness? And indeed, if we make gratitude the focus, and especially this idea of love, it will actually happen naturally that we cherish this kind of mutual affection that Paul speaks of in these verses. Here we see what Paul means when he says to set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Those things that are earthly we are to put to death. We are to put away from ourselves. But those things that are above, those things that reflect our God, that are the work of God's Spirit within us, these are the things that are, have our attention. What I want us to see in closing is that for the Apostle Paul, that doesn't mean that we walk around with our head in the clouds. We walk around with our eyes open, looking to see how we can love and serve one another. Indeed, as we, as, we, as we continue to grow as a congregation, as we continue to go through this time, may God work these things within us. Not because we are somehow in ourselves better, but because our God is great and He is the one who sanctifies. All to the praise of His glorious grace.